Um, a few uh, announcements. Uh, uh, first of all, I hope uh, people are doing okay with respect to power and such things. Um, uh, if there are any issues, uh, hopefully that gets fixed most likely today. And uh, the other thing is uh, because of this, I've decided to move the deadline of, uh, for homework one by a day. So you get uh, till next Thursday um, to finish the homework. Uh, and you know the material for every, everything you need for that homework is going to be done today uh, by the end of today's lecture. Um, we've you already got some stuff to get started, um, and we'll uh, wrap it up today. Uh, please do use Canvas for discussion um, because there's a fair amount of uh, uh, you who may have similar doubts, so it's probably worth just you know pulling them together and having a discussion. Um, in order to make up for the fact that uh, we lost the office hours yesterday, uh, there'll be extra office hours today, uh, not today, sorry, tomorrow uh, at uh, 11 o'clock. So, uh, you know, in case you're, uh, you had questions about the homework and you couldn't, uh, um, you, know, you couldn't get things done, uh, you can of course go to the office hours today. Some of you went to the office hours yesterday and there's one more tomorrow. Uh, I just found out that uh, this is not being live streamed on YouTube, so we'll share the recording after. Uh, we'll up I'll upload the recording after the class is done. Uh, one other uh, thing is that uh, there's there was a project milestone that was due, uh, I think today. Uh, so don't worry about it; it's not due today. Uh, it's been moved. Uh, there'll be an update on Canvas as well. Um, so it involved just getting you uh, connected to Kaggle and such uh, things, but we decided that. Uh, it would be easier if uh, we bundle a few things together. Uh, so watch out for something on Canvas, maybe uh, in a day or two. Um, are there any questions about um, the homework or the announce any of these announcements? So there's a question on chat. The ID3 algorithm doesn't seem to cover when all attributes are used. I don't understand the question. Um, what? Uh, all attributes are used. So I, oh, when you run out of attributes. So when you run out of attributes, yeah. So that, that, that's a, okay. So let me try to paraphrase this question. Um, so in the ID3 algorithm that we saw in class, when you are, let's say you are in a situation where you have, you have to build a tree somewhere in the recursive call and you don't have any more features left. You have used up all the features to build the path from the top to the bottom. So what do you do? I am assuming that's the question, Anthony. Um, so you don't have any more features left. So how can you build a tree? The answer is you can't. You just have to pick the most frequent label. So that's another edge case um, that uh, should, uh, yeah, you're right. That should be there, and it's it's it should be it's it's a base case. When you don't have any more features, just pick the majority label and move on because that's the best you can do. You don't have any information because you don't have any features. So what can you label? So the best guess you can make is the most frequent label. So that's what you do. So there are three base cases, that's right. And this is a, uh, it's interesting that you bring that up because it's not something that uh, uh, that happens often unless you have very few features. So uh, let me just, uh, there's a clarification. Uh, Han asks the most frequent label in the original samples or the subset, usually it's the subset. It's all, uh, because think about it this way, when you, by the time you come down to the subset, you have essentially found a set of examples that are similar according to all the features that are identical according to all the features that have come all the way from the top to of the tree to that node. So these are the most similar examples to a potential, if in the future, a new example comes down this path, this would be similar to all these examples that took you down this path. So you want the most frequent label in that. So there's a, um, formatting question that is answered. Yes, uh, you don't need to use lit LaTeX. Uh, many of you also emailed me about this. Uh, so you don't need to use LaTeX. Um, uh, honestly speaking, we just need to understand your answer. We need to understand your answer and that's on you. So you need to convince us that you know, you know what you're talking about. So as long as we get what you're saying, uh, it's fine. Um, there is, you know, this is why I don't insist on, I, I insist on not allowing handwritten submissions. Um, 
my handwriting is terrible and I expect nothing less from all of you. So other than handwritten solutions, anything's fine. Um, we give you a LaTeX template because several people do ask for LaTeX temp uh, templates, so that's why we do it. Um, and we make the homeworks in LaTeX, so it's just easier for us. But And the, the I think yesterday there was an announcement with the PDF also. So uh, that was of the, temp of the LaTeX template. So just uh, um, that's just to kind of give you a sense of what we expect in the output. What, what are all the things that they are looking for? So are we going to talk about any of the implementation of these algorithms or data structures? We will be sticking to the high level overview. Uh, I expect that you understand enough about the uh, implementation stuff that you make the right choices. Of course, I mean, that doesn't mean that we'll never help you out. If you have any questions, just ask in office hours or in the discussion. Uh, we In the class, we won't be talking about the implementation, but that doesn't mean that you are not allowed to ask about it. Uh, do feel free to ask about it in office hours or discussion. Um, and, you know, the, the, these implementation details uh, do tend to matter. Uh, so it's worth just kind of brainstorming um, uh, about this if you want. Uh, there's another question, Jupyter Notebook and or to HTML, okay. I don't know what is to HTML, but uh, Jupyter Notebook's okay. The, so you can uh, submit the Jupyter uh, Notebook and uh, I'm assuming it's an HTML uh, um, um, uh, output of the notebook or PDF. I don't know how Canvas renders HTML. So I know it, it can render PDF internally so that grading becomes easy. It can render Word docs easily. So just to be safe, I would suggest upload a PDF if you can. Uh, for your code, you can put all your code inside a Jupyter Notebook and that's also fine. Uh, people have done that in the past and uh, the TAs can just step through it and grade it. See, the thing is uh, we want to make grading as easy as possible for the TAs. And when I say we, I mean, not just me and my TAs, but also you, because the easier the, you make it uh, for your TAs to grade, the happier they will be. Are there any other questions? There don't seem to be questions. So let me now move on to the actual content of today's lecture. Uh, we're gonna continue where we left off with uh, decision trees and in the last lecture, we looked at information gain. So let me just uh, change my, I hope uh, you can see this. So in the last lecture, uh, we looked at information gain. And so now this is where it becomes, Um, so uh, we were talking about building a tree and the, the most important point is uh, we, we want to be able to, um, we, we want to be able to make sure that at every step along the way, we can uh, make a, we can build a tree that is, uh, uh, that's the most, the, the, we can split on an attribute that's the most informative. So. The setting is we are somewhere, I'm, I, I'm gonna try to draw on the screen. So this is uh, uncharted territory. So hopefully it still works. Um, not really, it turns out. Okay, I have to, looks like I have to stop sharing and redo this. So can, uh, so, Can people see? Okay, so this is going to be a strange lecture where I can't really do anything interactive. I do apologize for that. I have to just do a lecture and if there are questions, I'll try to figure out a way to answer them as we go along. Um, uh, so this is what happens when you get a new computer and all your previous settings are lost. So um, at any point of time in the uh, algorithm, the most important step involves, alas, this is a Mac, 
So it doesn't have MS Paint and there are many, many new settings that don't work. So Ashton, thanks for the suggestion. But uh, you, if you can see my mouse movements, I think that's the, I'm, I, that will take us a long way. So, uh, so the, keep in mind, the most important uh, thing that we are doing is we are picking a root attribute. So imagine that we have built a tree of this kind here and uh, we've come down to a certain node. Uh, imagine there are more features. And if we have more uh, features here, the goal is to decide which feature do we split on. And if we pick a certain feature to split on, we can move along and uh, uh, you know keep recursing down. So the question is, how do we pick a root attribute? And the suggestion from Quinlan uh, for the ID3 algorithm was we use this notion of information gain. Information gain is asking uh, the following question. Given a certain attribute A, what, what, how much uncertainty would you remove if you split on A? So if you have a certain attribute A, how much uncertainty would you remove? So you start off with the total uncertainty at the top, meaning you have a set of examples. You start off with the uncertainty of all the examples. Remember, uncertainty, we are quantifying using entropy. We will consider other cases in a different, uh, as we go along, but for now, uncertainty is entropy. So entropy of S is the uncertainty at the top of the tree. And then we split on the, uh, the, the data using the attribute A, and we ask, if you split on attribute A for each branch, so every branch of the attribute is a different value. Uh, uh, so every value of this attribute is a different branch, I apologize, sorry. So if you split on that, you have a subset of examples SV when attribute A takes value V. Um, and you can compute the entropy of that little subset. So each subtree is a branch coming out of A will have a um, subset of examples. So you can compute the entropy of that. And S, this term at the, at the beginning is the fraction of examples, SV divided by S, the size of SV divided by the size of S, is the fraction of examples in that branch. So when you, essentially this term here is the average entropy that remains after you split. So average entropy across all the branches, across all the values of A. So the entropy of S minus the average entropy that remains. This is the gain of entropy that you get uh, when you split on A. This is called the information gain attribute. And the idea is we should pick an attribute that gives us the most information gain. In other words, we should pick an attribute that takes away most of the uncertainty. And I asked you at the end of the last lecture on uh, last Thursday to go back and check uh, which split A or B was better. I hope you did that and uh, the answer would have been A. So now let's continue with uh, today's uh, lecture. Um, the point here is essentially to take advantage of the fact that entropy quantifies uncertainty. So let's now instantiate this idea on the tennis data set. So remember, we had these 14 examples. The task was to decide whether we play tennis today based on outlook, temperature, humidity, and wind. And uh, if last, if the if Tuesday's wind was anything to go by, when the wind is strong, you shouldn't play tennis. But uh, I don't know if that's what the data says. Um, but uh, so we have collected these 14 examples and we have to decide based on these four features whether to play tennis. So let's instantiate this idea, the ID3 algorithm using these four features. First things first, we need to measure what's the current entropy. The current entropy or the entropy of this data set is based on just the label. The there are, out of these 14 examples, nine of them are positive, all the green colored ones, and five of them are negative. The entropy, remember, is minus P log P for all values of the thing. So P plus log P plus, that's the, this term here. And P minus log P minus, P plus is uh, what I've called P here and N here. So if you just, plug this in, you'll get the entropy of this thing here, this data here is uh, 0.94, about 0.94. So this is fine. Now let's, uh, uh, what we have here is the uncertainty of the entire data. Just uh, as, an, as a reference, if you have a, a binary classification problem or just two, two possible outcomes, plus and minus, 
the maximum possible entropy is when both the probability of plus and the probability of minus are equal and that value is one so what we have here is something very close to one this is about as uncertain as it can be now we need to in order to compute the information gain we need to go through we need to consider a certain feature we need to go through one feature at a time so let's consider outlook which means we are only considering this first column so first we need to consider all possible subsets of the data so first let's consider where the case when outlook is sunny which is just these blocks of uh, examples these five examples here five of the 14 out of these five there are two of them that are positive so it's this one here and this one here and three of them are negative so p the fraction of positive examples is two fifths and the fraction of negative examples is three fifths so we can compute the entropy of these five examples alone and it comes out to 0.97 we can do the same for outlook equals overcast so there are four examples and all four of them are the same label there's a nice trick you don't need to do any computation the trick is if there is no uncertainty entropy is zero so all four labels have the same label or all four examples have the same label so and in this case the entropy is zero and then we look at outlook is rainy um, and uh, we get like there are five examples and you'll get you, you should compute uh, just make sure that uh, I'm not lying to you, uh, but you'll find that the entropy for rainy is uh, 0.97. So we have three subsets. Each feature has three labels, and uh, we've computed the entropy of each of these subsets. The expected entropy of splitting on this particular label is 514th times 0.97 for the, sun, uh, the case of sunny, 414th times zero for the case of overcast, and 514th times 0.97 for rainy. And so you get 0.69. So the information gain is the entropy of the total data, which is 0.94, which we computed in the previous slide, minus the entropy of splitting the average entropy when you split on Outlook. So the, inf the gain of splitting on Outlook is 0.24. Are there any questions? So there is one question. Is entropy always less than or equal to one? Entropy is for if you have only two labels, entropy is always less than or equal to one if you have more than two labels entropy is not in general the entropy is always less than or equal to log to the base two by the way all the logarithms here are to the base two entropy is log to the base two of the number of outcomes so log to the base two of two is uh, uh, one so entropy of binary classification is always less than or equal to one uh, or entropy of uh, uh, binary is always uh, less than or equal to one. Uh, we haven't covered Gini and misclassification yet, but we will do that in uh, a little bit. But we'll see that uh, uh, Gini and misclassification are less than 0.5. So the next question is where do the 514th, etc., come in? Ah, so notice that there are five out of 14 examples with label sunny. So these, oh, what have I done? So these five out of the 14 have the label sunny so this fraction of examples has an entropy of 0.97 so that's five out of 14 that's the 514th here uh, similarly uh, there are four out of the 14 examples these four out of the 14 have entropy zero so this fraction has entropy zero so you get the 414 and similarly 514th is the fraction of examples that have label uh, feature value raining so it's basically how, what fraction of examples have that particular feature value. Does that answer your question, Patrick? Yeah. Are there any other questions? Now I'm going through this in a fair amount of detail because uh, this is actually simple and these calculations fit on a slide and it's worth kind of just getting a sense of what this algorithm is doing. Uh, let's do this one more time. I'm not going to go into all the details when the outlook is uh, sorry when next we need to consider temperature and humidity and everything so i'm considering temperature here uh, so sorry humidity here so humidity takes only two values either high or i think neutral so when humidity is high there are three examples so sorry there are seven examples when humidity is high it's these four here this one here and this one and this one three out of them have uh, are labeled positive these two 
and I think this one here, and four out of them are labeled negative. So the entropy is uh, 0.98, and when the humidity is normal, you have seven examples again, and you'll find that six of them are positive and one of them is negative. So you get humidity. The uh, when the humidity is normal, the entropy is 0.59. So the expected entropy is seven out of 14. In half the examples, it's 0.98. In the remaining half, it's 0.59. So the uh, entropy that re remains after splitting on humidity is 0.78. This means the information gain is 0.94, the original entropy of the full data, minus the expected entropy of the split. So it's 0.15. Notice that when the expected entropy is high, the information gain goes down because you're this is the remaining uncertainty after splitting on this label. So uh, the difference uh, is smaller. So you keep doing, you need to do this for each feature and you'll find that Outlook has entropy uh, information gain of 0.24, humidity is 0.15, the wind is 0.48 and the temperature is uh, 0.29 and Outlook has the highest information gain. As per the ID3 algorithm, what this means is we need to split on Outlook and we start building a tree of this kind. So we have, uh, we've started the, now we, the, we've identified the root and we've started building this tree. Once you split on this, we can now partition the data into three buckets, every value that the outlook can take. It can be sunny or overcast or rain. These are row numbers here, one, two, eight, nine, and 11 is one, two, I think eight, nine, and 11. All those examples fall into this bucket. In the overcast case, these are the example and in the rain case, these examples. And the interesting thing to note is when Outlook is overcast, you don't need to do anything more. This falls into one of the base cases of the algorithm. There is nothing more to be done. All these examples have the same label, so you can just put a label here. You basically stop growing the tree. In the other case, we need to con we have to consider all other cases till this situation happens. Either we've uh, used up all the features or all the examples have the same label. So let's uh, consider, I'm not going to go into all the details, but let's just consider a little bit uh, more. Uh, we have this case here when the outlook is sunny. You know, I've grayed out this feature here because we have used up this feature. We have temperature, humidity, or the wind to consider. Um, we need to consider temperature, humidity, or the wind. And we do the same thing again. We compute the information gain of this set of examples with respect to temp humidity, with respect to temperature, and the wind. And we find that when the you know when we split on humidity, we basically get uh, we uh, both sides of the split. Uh, we get uh, when humidity is high, all the, uh, uh, the the examples have a label of no. When humidity is normal, all examples have a label yes. That means that uh, entropy of the expected entropy is zero, which means the information gain is 0.97, and so on. You know you should really work through this and. By the way, if you, if you want to debug your code, this is a fantastic set of examples because essentially I'm stepping through what your algorithm should be doing and showing you all the values. So you can actually use this example to debug your ID3 code. Anyway, so on this thing, on this side, you split on humidity and uh, on this side, you split on wind and you basically you get the whole tree. So the, 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 there's a question, is the optimal tree the minimal tree? Uh, in some sense, yes, the best possible tree, according to this philosophy that we, we are pushing for, which is smaller trees are better, the best possible tree is the tree with the fewest number of nodes, the smallest, uh, the, the, the shallowest tree. ID3 does not guarantee that you will get the globally optimal tree, meaning you will, you, ID3 does not guarantee you'll get the shallowest tree among all trees that fit the data. All it guarantee, all it tells you is that it imposes a preference for shorter trees because it wants to remove as much uncertainty as possible at each step. But it does not come with a certificate that says you're going to get the shortest possible tree. All you will get is a tree that is small and hopefully good. So is it possible to, so is it, there's another question, is it better to have a shallow tree or shallow but wide? or the opposite, the choice of the width doesn't really depend on the algorithm. Remember that the width of the tree depends on 
uh, on finding on the features that you use. So it doesn't really depend on the algorithm. So it depends on the featureization that you have. So it's not necessarily um, the, the uh, something that the algorithm controls, but it, you do get to control it when you design your features. In general, it is better to have smaller trees overall, small, you know, shallow and uh, uh, narrow. That's the opposite of wide. So uh, you want to have as few decisions as possible because that's the one, if, so, so the way to think about it is if you have as a small number of decisions and yet as much as uh, uh, all, all the uncertainty in the data is removed, it's highly unlikely that this was just accidental. And this is something we'll talk about a, a bit more when we talk about overfitting uh, towards the end of today's lecture. I'll come back to that. It is an NP hard problem to find the optimal tree. Yes. So uh, to answer Anka's question, there's another one. Uh, the algorithm seems like it will be more computationally expensive as the depth increases. Do we depth restrict the depth to a maximum depth to address this? It's one of the reasons why we restrict the depth to address this. The more uh, pressing reason is we will see that shorter trees will generalize better. So yes, we will impose a depth restriction and your homework also asks you to do that. What do we do when we have two features with the same information gain? You toss a coin. You pick one randomly uh, and uh, that's the best you can do. All right, so just to kind of uh, wrap up this tiny part, uh, remember, the, we talked about hypothesis spaces in the previous lecture when we talked about uh, the introduction to supervised learning. The hypothesis space for decision trees is all possible functions. And this is kind of a problem. When we uh, discussed hypothesis spaces in the previous uh, module, I mentioned that uh, you don't want to consider all possible functions because searching over all possible functions is going to lead to problems. We cannot search over all possible functions. That's where the NP hardness comes in. And if you search over all possible functions, if you want to find the function that agrees with your data, it might require a massive number of examples. So it has, that's a disadvantage. However, the advantage is that we can fit any data. Uh, that may not uh, be uh, as good a thing as uh, it sounds, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more uh, as uh, in a bit, in a little while. The goal is to find the best tree. We def define best as uh, the small, smallest tree that is consistent with the data, but that process, finding the smallest tree that is consistent with the data is NP hard, which means it is computationally uh, intractable to find the smallest tree that's consistent with the set of examples. We, in, in order to uh, kind of get around that computational problem, we give up on this guarantee of minimality. Instead of saying that we'll find the smallest possible tree among all possible trees, we will do a greedy search. We will keep going down the tree and never backtrack. Uh, those of you who may have taken an artificial intelligence class might recognize the term hill climbing without backtracking and ID3 is essentially doing that. Uh, another uh, thing to mention about ID3, by the way, if you didn't, if you don't uh, get this phrase, to worry about. Another uh, thing, ca characterization of this algorithm, notice that the ID3 algorithm is something that takes all the examples and makes a decision to uh, predi pre predict the tree. This is in contrast with uh, an iterative algorithm, which uh, sorry, an incremental algorithm, which as it gets new information, keeps updating uh, the hypothesis. There is some work, uh, there was some work in the late 80s on how do you do, uh, how do you handle this case when you get, you have a bunch of examples, you've built a tree and you get two more examples. How do you update the tree? So there was some work in the late 80s, but uh, for most, for the most part, when you build decision trees, when you get two more examples, you rebuild the tree from scratch. So just to kind of uh, wrap up this part, um, we looked at what decision trees are. It's a hierarchical data structure that represents all the data. And we looked at one algorithm, the ID3 heuristic, um, that 
uh, that builds decision trees. There's a technical difference between an algorithm and a heuristic. A heuristic doesn't come with a guarantee. For an algorithm, we can prove some sort of optimality. In ID3, we can't. So it's probably the right thing to call it is the, uh, an ID3 heuristic. So the ID3 heuristic is very simple. If all examples have the same label, then you create a leaf node with that label. Otherwise, you find the most informative feature or attribute and split the data into different partitions for different values of that attribute. And then you uh, uh, recur keep recursing down. You could make a recursive call to the same algorithm. This is it. So let me just uh, see if there's a question. Uh, does having something close to an optimal tree get you some closer to the uh, best tree? I don't understand the difference between optimal and best. So can you clarify the question, Christian? So the optimal tree is a smaller tree. Ah, I see. Okay, good. So, okay, this is a uh, fantastic question. So let me, uh, uh, just for the sake of the video, let me uh, uh, explain the question. We talked about an optimal tree. An optimal tree is just an algorithmic thing. It's a tree that is the smallest according to the number of nodes, according to depth. But that's not what we care about. The goal of machine learning is generalization. So the goal of machine learning is generalization to future examples. That's all we care about. And so we can define the best tree as the most accurate tree in the future. So then how do I, how can I uh, make this claim that the optimal tree, that is the smallest tree is also the best tree. This is essentially an assumption. We have no, every learning algorithm, has to make an assumption about how it defines best, how it defines the, uh, how it characterizes the most general tree. The assumption for ID3 for generalization is smaller trees are going to be better. Now, for now, I'm going to ask you to just take me on my word and you know, we will, uh, that smaller trees will generalize better. This is for now just an assumption and this is just an intuitive assumption which uh, is built on the following uh, uh, following uh, line of reasoning. If you have a small tree, then it is highly unlikely that a small tree would fit a massive data set, would be consistent with a massive data set. So there is some uh, sort of a preference for, uh, so think of it as the hypothesis space among the set, the, the set of small trees, is a much smaller set than the set of large trees. And so if you can find an explanation from the data, uh, for the data among just a small set, it is highly unlikely that nature was trying to fool you by getting a massive data set to be consistent with just a small set. So it's a hypothesis based assumption. So this is an assumption that for now is, uh, let's just say, because I said so, somewhere in the middle of the semester, we will actually prove a theorem that shows that this assumption is a, a perfectly valid one. When we talk about computational learning theory, we will see that having a smaller hypothesis space leads to a higher probability of more accurate classifiers. So this assumption for now is just uh, um, something that take it as a given. And we'll come back to this sometime in the middle of the semester. Okay. So that's an excellent question. It's a question that is worth uh, you know, thinking about. Is entropy used as the measure for information gain in practice? Um, that's a very good question because that's the segue to the next thing that we're gonna do. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, reshare my screen because this is the next, uh, I hope you can see this. So that's a good segue for uh, the next thing that we'll talk about. So we talked about what are decision trees. We talked about a rather um, simple heuristic for growing decision trees. It may seem involved and tedious and complicated, but once you spend a little time implementing this, 
and playing with it and just working it out. I, I, I recommend that before you even implement it, just work out the details on paper and convince yourself that this is nothing more than just a mechanical process, like something so boring that even a computer can do it. If that's the case, then you can implement it. So now let's look at some extension. And the first extension is related to the question that Patrick asked, which is, is, uh, uh, is entropy generally used? So we'll look at some variants of this entropy-based criterion that's used for growing trees. Then we'll talk about uh, handling examples that, have, um, that don't have all the features, that uh, have missing features. And we'll revisit this question of what to do when you don't have Boolean features, but something else. And Hopefully, most of the time that's left, I'll spend on uh, this question of avoiding overfitting. And that's going to be one of the first uh, uh, high-level lessons about general machine learning that we'll take away from this module. Let's talk about the variants, uh, some variants of the information gain uh, uh, heuristic. Remember, information gain is just, uh, 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 it's just a heuristic that's used to define uh, or you know, rank different features by uh, or different attributes by which of them gives you most information by trying out that split and guessing. Oh, you know what? If I had a split on this particular feature, most of this uncertainty is removed. Uncertainty or disorder or impurity. Uncertainty is often measured using entropy, but there are other indices for measuring uh, disorder or impurity. Um, the two popular ones in the decision tree uh, literature are majority error and the Gini index. The majority error has a very nice uh, intuitive understanding, so I'll uh, uh, go over an example. So suppose you're forced to stop growing the tree at some node. Suppose you're told you have come down to some node and you're told, you know what, you're not allowed to grow the tree anymore. You have to find the most, at this point, you have to just, you're not allowed to use any more features, just stop growing the tree. Then the best thing you can do is to pick the most frequent label. If you pick the most frequent label, then at least um, you'll, you have a higher than average chance of being right. So for example, if you are forced to stop growing a tree and you have 15 positive examples and five negative examples, the best thing you can do is to say that the label is plus. What happens then is the remaining labels, the five negative examples, you're going to have an error. If you use these 20 examples as, an, as, a, uh, as a reasonable estimate for what will happen in the future, then five out of the 20 examples will uh, give you an error, which means one fourth of these examples are going to be problematic. One fourth of these examples are uh, going to give you an error and that's the majority error. The majority error is essentially saying, what is the error you would get if you had chosen uh, the majority label, the most frequent label? And this, in some sense, behaves a lot like entropy. Let's uh, look at some examples. In fact, there are other variants also. So I've written the mathematical expressions for all three of these things. The entropy is something we saw before. If you, if you have P, if P denotes the fraction of positive examples, then one minus P is the fraction of negative examples. Entropy is P log P plus one minus P log one minus P, and the whole thing is negative. And if you want to plot it as a fraction of the positive examples on the horizontal axis and this ex all these functions on the vertical axis, entropy is zero when P is zero, and it's zero when P is one, and it increases when P goes all the way to, the, uh, to uh, when P becomes half. What this means is when the uncertainty is the maximum. When is the uncertainty maximum? When the, uh, all the labels are, uh, sorry, when exactly half the labels are positive and half the labels are negative. So entropy correlates with uncertainty. These other expressions also do the same. Majority error, which I just spoke about, is you pick the, uh, uh, the, the majority error is the, error when you pick the label to be the most frequent label, which means it's the smaller of P and one minus P, because that's, those are the examples on which you're willing to uh, have an error. So it's essentially min of P and one minus P. And if you plot that, it goes up and comes down. 
the Gini index is another one, which is the sum of p square and one minus p square, and you take one minus the whole thing. Notice that all of these measures of uh, uncertainty or uh, impurity have a similar shape. Each measure peaks when the uncertainty is the highest. In other words, when p is 0.5, and in all cases, they become zero when the uh, uncertainty is not there. In, when p is zero, there's no uncertainty. All labels are negative. When p is one, there is still no uncertainty because all labels are positive. And in, uh, in both cases, all three of these um, have the same value, namely zero. So all of them peak when uh, uncertainty is highest and all of them have the lowest value when the uncertainty is the lowest. So all of these work like entropy. In some sense, they have the same shape as entropy. So you can define information gain. You know, you have to define information gain as the average, uh, sorry, as the total entropy. We saw it as total entropy minus the average entropy of uh, when you uh, split on that feature. Instead, you can say the total majority error minus the average majority error when you split on a label or the same for Gini index. And you can replace entropy in the definition of the information gain when you do this. Entropy was what was used in the original definition of the ID3 algorithm, but there are variants. Uh, a popular family of uh, decision tree algorithms called CAR uh, use Gini index. I think your homework is also asking you to play with these kinds of variants. And it's worth considering whether, and I'll leave this as an exercise for you to think about, and also you, it, I ask about this in the homework. So we're thinking about whether there will be any qualitative difference in the tree um, when you uh, when you have a when you know you use this measure or that measure, there is a question from Christopher uh, about LP balls. Um, I suggest we take that discussion offline. It's going to it will uh, take us a little off track. So I will um, you know um, I'll get to you can we can talk about that offline. All right, so next, um, the generalization of this thing is sometimes, you know, you don't, uh, uh, oh, there's a question about the Gini index. When you use Gini index, um, uh, instead of entropy, do you still use the same formula? That's right. All you do is replace entropy with the Gini index value. So anytime you see entropy in the definition of information gain, you replace it with the Gini index. And similarly for majority error, that's that's exactly right. You don't, uh, so yeah, I, I have nothing more to say because I think what you said is perfect. Okay, so let's consider uh, the case when you don't have a certain feature. So for example, um, let's say that you have uh, this humidity, let's say on day eight, your humidity sensor stopped working. Um, and you just, that doesn't mean that uh, the day doesn't count. It's just a missing feature. So what do you do? Uh, this is a, something to think about in general also, because you know you might encounter data sets where a certain feature is missing. So how do you deal with that? There are, in some sense, all the missing feature uh, imputation methods end up completing the example. One thing you could do is you can find the most common value of the attribute in the data. So in this data set, out of these five examples, let's ignore the fourth or middle row because uh, we don't know the value. The remaining four examples, high is the most common one. So you can replace the question mark with high. Another possibility is you notice that this is you know post hoc uh, analysis because you are completing the data set. So you notice that these three examples have label no. Then among, you only consider the, sorry, you, you notice that this row eight has the label no, so you only consider the examples where the label is no, and you fill in the, uh, uh, the humidity value from there, so it's high. Another thing you could do is something slightly more complicated. You use fractional counts. Instead of saying that this attribute is, uh, uh, this attribute is, uh, high or low, what you do is uh, you say that among the remaining four examples, three out of the four were high and one out of the four is uh, normal. So this example gets filled in with not 
neither high nor low, but three fourths high and one fourth normal. So this is uh, this row eight essentially becomes uh, uh, this to use uh, a fanciful word. This becomes a superposition of both high and normal humidity. It's both a combination of three fourths high and one fourth uh, normal uh, humidity. So you treat this as a fractional count. What this means is you have to reconsider how the probability computations happen with your uh, fractional feature values. The answer is nothing should change because remember when we are computing feet probabilities before we compute probabilities we count. What does it mean to count? We are count well, when we are counting high we count this is plus one so counting is just adding one right we are adding one high here one here and one here. When we had a three fourths here so we'll add a three fourths. Who said that counts should only be incremented by one? You add a three-fourth high for this. And when you add normal, you'll add a one-fourth normal here. So the count of the humidity equals high becomes three and three quarters. And the count of normal becomes one and one-fourth. So as an exercise, I want you to kind of work through this and think about whether this changes the probability computations and uh, ask questions if uh, they come up. This is at training time. At test time, what do you do? You can essentially use some of these same methods. You may not be able to use the middle one because you don't know the label, but when the values being, when, when the model is being deployed, um, you can essentially fill in the values using one of these same methods. So there's a question about, should we keep the features with missing values to use on the lower nodes? Not really. Um, you just, uh, you, you can't tell upfront which feature will be missing because uh, what happens when you like you as you ask what happens when the root feature is missing a value what you do is you take a guess based on the highest uh, so let's say we use this method the most common value in the data you take a you use the most common value and you move on there's going to be a mistake we we'll live with that mistake one of the fundamental things that we'll have to deal with across all learning algorithms is sometimes our classifiers are going to make mistakes and we have to live with it so we just uh, we don't get to control which features will be missing at test time because remember a feature or an attribute is it's worth thinking about it as a sensor we can't control which sensor breaks down on what day let's now consider a third uh, uh, variant uh, or a third uh, uh, thing which is what do you do when your features are not boolean We've already seen the case when your features are, when your features can take multiple values, you just, uh, you know, have a tree with, that's not binary. Who said that decision trees have to be binary? You can have a feature uh, that takes three values. So your outlook feature here, it can be sunny or outlook or overcast or rainy. You get three branches coming out of the tree. Another possibility, which is uh, essentially identical, uh, is you convert the feature into uh, this exclamation mark should be an arrow. You convert the feature into a binary thing. The fact that feature is uh, the feature outlook takes the value sunny becomes three binary features. Outlook sunny is true, outlook overcast is false, and outlook uh, rain is false. So you get you convert this one feature into three. You don't really change anything. This is just in case your code can only handle binary um, uh, features. Another possibility is you can group the feature values into disjoint sets. You can group overcast and sunny into one group, uh, overcast or sunny, and the rain becomes another group. The other uh, thing to think about is what do you do when you have numeric features? And we've already discussed this when we talked about uh, just the decision tree, when we, when, we, when we looked at the introduction to the decision trees. For numeric features, you have to somehow discretize it. You can use thresholds or ranges to essentially bucket different value, different ranges of uh, uh, new, the, the feature into, uh, uh, you know, into different groups. And how do you know how to bucket? There are many different strategies for this. One simple thing is you just predefine the buckets. Another way to do about the, do is you examine the data and you come up with some clever heuristics for bucketing the data or something else. And all of these might be fine. All right, let's now talk about perhaps the most important point of this lesson. I'm kind of rushing through this because I want to spend enough time on overfitting. 
And if there are questions, we'll come back to this. Please feel, feel free to use the chat. Let's talk about overfitting. Um, overfitting is something that we we'll have to worry about throughout the entire semester. Overfitting is a problem that every machine learning algorithm has to deal with. Let me introduce this question uh, using this made up function called the first fit function. It's a Boolean function that takes n inputs. In this case, in this example here, there are two. And it ignores all the features, all n uh, like all but one of the features. It ignores n minus one features and essentially copies over the first feature. That's why it's called the first bit. The, the label is simply the first bit. So these two examples have a label false, these two examples have a label true. When essentially y equals x0 and x1 is irrelevant. When you have more features, x1, x2, x3, everything is irrelevant. It's easy to draw the decision tree for this function. Um, it's essentially a, function, a tree that looks like this. You, have, you look at the first feature, if x0 is true, you say true. If x0 is false, you say false. And all other features are ignored. Now, as an exercise, here's another place where you can give the ID3 algorithm a test run. ID, the ID3 algorithm should uh, generate exactly this tree. So convince yourself of this. This is another place where you can, a small data set where you can work out uh, the details of the ID3 algorithm. Okay. So now let's say we have all two power n examples for training. A question that's worth thinking about is what will be the error on any future example? And this is where if I had a more complicated, uh, my full set of work, I would be launching a poll, but uh, Maybe someone can answer this question. What would the, if let's say you have all uh, you have two power n examples um, for training? So there are it's two power n because you have n features and two power n uh, possible rows in the tr truth table. Let's say you build a decision tree using two power n training examples. What will the error of this tree be on future examples? Does anyone want to just answer in the chat? Zero. Yes, there are a couple of you who mentioned zero, and yes, that's right. The error should be zero because we have seen all two power n examples during training. That's one thing. We have seen every possible input. And the second thing to note is the ID3 algorithm that builds a decision tree that is consistent with the entire data. What does it mean to be consistent? For every row in that table, it will give the lay, it will give the correct label. If you have seen every possible row, then of course, future examples have to be from among these two power n, so the error is going to be zero, which is uh, perfect, okay? But life is not perfect. There's going to be noise in our data. Let's say we have all two power n examples, but there is an enemy that corrupts an example before we encounter it. So every example is randomly corrupted, something like this, so maybe this row was originally false, but it has been made true. This row was originally true and it has been made false. So one fourth of the examples have been corrupted. And let's say that uh, the training and test sets are no longer identical. Both the train and test set are randomly corrupted. Each row is randomly corrupted independently. So then we can still build a decision tree, right? I mean, we may not know that there's noise in the data. We are just given a data, like you're given a data set in your homework. Maybe it has noise, maybe not. So then what do you do? You can build a decision tree. And this is an experiment that I ran at some point. When the data is noisy and we have all two power n examples with the horizontal axis represents the number of features and the vertical ac axis represents the test accuracy. And basically what's going on is, and this is the error bars are over multiple runs uh, because every example is randomly corrupted. What we're seeing is essentially the error becomes roughly converges to about 0.375. Um, th this is not an accident that this number is nice, a nice round number. You can actually analytically compute this. Uh, again, the, the pound signs are, um, ignore that. It's, uh, I, I'll fix this on the slide thing, but you can work this out yourself. Basically what this means is that the training set accuracy is, sorry, the test set accuracy is going to essentially be about 
37%, somewhere around this part of the, uh, as the number of features increases. And you can compute this on paper, you don't need to run an experiment. But what about the training accuracy? Does anyone want to uh, uh, take a guess? What will the date, what will the learned decision tree predict on the training example? One guess is 0.25 because one fourth of the examples are corrupted. But remember, the decision tree learner, nor the program that you're running, nor you know which examples are corrupted. As, corrupted. as far as you're con concerned, the training set is um, what you have. So is what many of you are now saying one, Yes, the training set accuracy would be zero, sorry, uh, would be one and the error would be zero. Because when you're given the examples that you have, you have no idea which examples are corrupted. The learning algorithm will find a tree, whether there's an error or not, it will find a tree that agrees with all the data. The decision tree learner will find a consistent tree. Not only does it fit the signal, in the data, it also fits the noise. And that's the problem. The classifier is not perfect because what we say, the classifier has overfit the training data. It has fit the signal, namely the first bit function. And also it has memorized, in some sense, all the noise that your random uh, corrupter has introduced into the data set. And this is the problem of overfitting. Overfitting is a situation where your learning algorithm is in some sense memorizing the noise in the data. And it's not going to be helpful because memorizing the noise in the data means it will do very well on the training set, but future performance is going to uh, take a hit. So there are many, many things that can cause overfitting. If there are irrelevant attributes or noisy examples or noisy features, uh, this decides which of the hypothesis space, which function in the hypothesis space gets selected. And if your choice of the hypothesis in the hypothesis space is determined by these noisy examples, by the noise in the examples, or by features that don't matter, then your choice of uh, uh, the classifiers or the hypothesis is not good. What this means is as you go along in the future, if you're going to use this particular function that to make a call, you will have bad performance. This is the problem of overfitting. Let me give you one definition of overfitting that this is from uh, Mitchell's book, uh, the chapter on decision trees. Imagine that there is a process, a random process that generates your data, both the example and the label. The data comes from some probability distribution D that uh, uh, that's over both X and Y. X is the instance space, Y is the, uh, the label space. So the data comes from some probability distribution. And I see now here that uh, all the math is wrong. So I will, anytime you, I'll fix this uh, slide uh, later on, but anytime you see a two, this is supposed to be element of. Um, so I, I will read this correctly and fix the slides when I post them. So we are using this hypothesis space H. The training error for this hypothesis space is a little h. So let's say that we find a hypothesis little h for inside the space. Let's define the training error as, uh, as this term, error train. Error train is the error that this particular function h makes on the training set. We don't care about the training error. Our goal is generalization, doing well in the future. We define the future using this probability distribution. The true error, also called the generalization error of the same function h is, we call it error d, error sub d of h. It's the generalization error of the, um, this particular hypothesis. Now let's say that for some reason, we really like this hypothesis. In fact, we like this hypothesis because we think the training error of this hypothesis is really low. Like in the first bit function, Maybe the training error is zero. So we really like this hypothesis. So we are going to, as the learning algorithm, we are going to say, this is the hypothesis that we need to pick. Then what we do is uh, in the future, we measure the error of this hypothesis using error D. This is the future error or the true error or the generalization error. Now let's say 
the learning algorithm we have has decided that this is the hypothesis h is the hypothesis to pick but there's another hypothesis h prime as far as this learning algorithm goes h prime is much worse it has a higher training error that's the row one here the training error of h is less than the training error of h prime so as far as the training error goes h looks like a better function it looks like a better guess but in fact the generalization error of h is worse the generalization or error of h prime is better than the generalization error of h then we say the hypothesis h has overfit the data because there is another function that looks worse as far as the training and training error is concerned but it looks much better for real when it matters in terms of generalization then we say that this club function h has overfit the data are there any uh, questions about this because this is an important concept so i, I would like to uh, spend a little time and i'll correct these uh, uh, errors in my slides uh, before posting them how do we know the future error now that's the uh, that's the million dollar question how could we possibly know the future error because we don't get to see the future we don't we can't in fact this is where we have to make a guess this is where this is the idea of an inductive uh, bias this is where we have to essentially bring in some sort of an idea from philosophy that says i believe if a hypothesis has this property it will generalize better that property would not depend on the training data that property would depend just on the function class on the set of functions that we consider and if we consider functions from this set i believe that uh, it will uh, overfit it will not overfit and based on that we have to make a call and this is where we have to in some sense uh bake our assumptions about the problem so, uh, let me give you a concrete example let's consider this uh, uh the tennis data so let's say that we have to decide when to play tennis and we have these all these weather attributes and then there's also another feature let's say there's this feature that uh, uh, says whether i have a certain book on my table on a certain day yes or no it can take two values you can measure that you can look at the table and see whether the book is there if the book is there the you, the feature takes a value yes if not the feature takes a value no clearly whether the book is on my table or not cannot possibly influence whether i should play tennis or not let's hope that we live in a world that has that level of sanity then uh, adding that one extra feature increases the hypothesis space increases the set of possible trees for example that you can consider so now we make a ch choice we have a smaller set of features or a larger set of features to influence whether we grow a smaller tree or a larger tree if you have a larger tree maybe you will overfit the noise in the data maybe you discover some statistical correlations in the way you collected the data that accidentally seems to suggest that the book feature influences whether you should play tennis or not but something tells us hopefully that that feature should not be included how can you quantify that and this is something we'll uh, look at quite a bit more as we go ahead the problem is that decision trees will overfit as the size of the tree the horizontal axis in this plot is the size uh, decision trees will overfit the solid line is the training error on a certain data set this is from tom mitchell's textbook the dotted line is the generalization error on on uh, test data on examples that the training algorithm never got to see notice that after about 20 feet 20 as the number of nodes in the tree grows over 20 the training accuracy keeps going up but the test accuracy keeps going down so in some sense what's happening is that we have a limited number of training examples and the tree that we are growing as the number of examples goes up keeps representing the training data better and better but it's really not representing the true concept so the there is a question do we just need more training data and the suggestion is that's just delaying the problem yes and no if you have 
every possible example that can exist, then maybe it makes sense to overfit. But we'll never see every possible example and we'll never ever see the noise in the data because noise could be random. So it's always, rather than getting more training data, more training data always helps in general. But uh, it's worth simultaneously also thinking about controlling the hypothesis space itself. This is the idea of Occam's razor. With decision trees, notice that bigger trees tend to overfit. Occam's razor says favor simpler hypotheses. So shorter trees, there are fewer shorter trees. As a result, it's less likely to fit the noise by just accident. Uh, so if we only consider uh, smaller trees, then maybe it's a better deal. Maybe you are going to, you, you will not, if you only consider smaller trees and you get a good enough performance, then there's less chance that you have fit the noise. So you might probably be better off considering only the smaller trees. There are a few clarification questions. What if the training performance goes up really fast and the test performance goes up, but not that fast? Um, yeah, that's going to ha that's almost definitely going to happen. Um, we can't use the test set to ever decide on the classifier. Because remember, the test set is a measure of future performance. In order to decide what the, how to pick uh, uh, you know, these sort of th the choices, we have to use only the training set. And this is where this idea of cross-validation comes in. In your homework, you're going to use cross-validation. Uh, your homework, uh, uh, the document that describes the home that has the question has a rather detailed description of how to use cross-validation. I'll encourage you to read that carefully and come up with questions. I'll probably spend a little bit of time uh, next Tuesday describing cross-validation and talking about it, but I encourage you to uh, read that thing and kind of envision essentially cross-validation is this idea that allows you to discover uh, which subset of your hypothesis space would work without using the training set and it's the best guess. Now the question is, what if your data has no noise? Can you still overfit? If you're in this really charmed situation that you have no noise in the data, go for it, overfit, because uh, you are learning from pure signal. Also tell me what that situation is because I would like to cash in on that because I don't know of any data set which doesn't have noise. So some ideas for favoring smaller trees. One idea is you fix the depth of the tree. This is what you're doing in your homework. Uh, you fix the depth of the tree if you, you say that ID3 will, basically you keep track of the depth of the tree in, in your recursion inside ID3. And when the depth reaches a certain limit, you just exit by saying, pretending that uh, you have no more features. You just take the majority label and you uh, exit the recursion. Uh, an extreme case of this is called a decision stump where it's a decision tree with just one level. Usually decision stumps by themselves are pretty lousy. But uh, you'll see that decision stumps uh, can form a, uh, uh, a good basis for discovering good features for a second level of learning. We'll come to that when we talk about ensembles. Uh, this is really what's going on when we, so John's question is about, does it make sense to train uh, many trees of various depths and, uh, ah, okay, actually John's question is important. So let me uh, address this because would it make sense to uh, train many trees of various, de various depths and run the test set on these trees to see whether we can start to see the decline? The answer is absolutely not because remember, the test set is a representation of the future. If you use the test set to decide which uh, depth to use, the depth of the tree is called a hyperparameter. All learning algorithms come with hyperparameters. If you use the test set to decide on your hyperparameter, then your hyperparameter choice is overfitting the test set, which means you will essentially get a classifier that seems to look good, but is actually not. The test set is supposed to represent the future. It's supposed to represent examples that you don't get to see. So if you overfit the test set, then you tend, you, you might, you accidentally believe that your classifier is really good when in fact it's not. Overfitting the test set in some sense would end up, you'll get a plot similar to this, you might end up picking a classifier that uh, 
uh, that looks good according to the test, this particular test set, but not on the real future. But what I thought you were saying was, uh, can we train a bunch of trees uh, and uh, you know, essentially try to aggregate them later? And that is something that we can do for sure. Another thing is you optimize, not on the test set, but on a separate set of examples called a held out set or a development set or a validation set. So what you do is you take your training data, you split it into two parts. You have uh, the, your training data, you already considered there's another set of examples called the test set, which we will never see. We'll see that only once at the end when we are going to evaluate, uh, write our report, let's say. But the training set itself, we split into the training portion and a validation or a held out portion. You grow the tree on the training split and you, you uh, try all possible depths on the validation set. And if the, if the, if the tree um, uh, you know, of a certain depth seems to hurt performance on validation, you plot stop growing. We still haven't seen the test set. You pick the depth that is the, the best according to the validation. Now you collect all the data together and uh, regrow the tree to that depth. And uh, that's the tree that you'll evaluate. The cross validation that you'll be doing in your uh, uh, homework is actually a fancier version of this. We are working, so there's a question about, are we working under, under the assumption that our uh, uh, test set doesn't have noise in it? We are not. If our test set has noise in it, we are gonna live with it and we will lose accuracy because of that. But there's nothing we can do about it. We are implicitly, if you think about it, working under the assumption that the test set has roughly the same kind of noise or the same level of noise as we see in the training set. Um, this is an implicit assumption for now. As we go along, when we talk again, when we talk about learning theory, we will make that assumption explicit and that's what we will use to build our theory. But for now, we are assuming that our test set may have noise, but there's nothing we can do because we can't detect noise. Another uh, uh, exam, another approach for, again, going back to this idea of Occam's razor where we want shorter trees is you grow the tree all the way to the full depth and then start pruning it. Uh, there's basically you start uh, removing either branches or entire paths in the tree uh, so that validation performance goes up. You can start pruning from the bottom up greedily using the validation set or you can do more fancy things like remember a decision tree is essentially a collection of rules. So you can convert the tree into rules and just erase rules. And now the remaining rules are the ones that you're going to keep. How do you know which rules to erase or which node in the tree to remove? What you do, you use the validation set, you remove a node, you check, see if it works. If it gives a slight bump up in accuracy on the validation set, and if it improves things, then you keep that node removed and you iterate. This is a greedy process. You could do more complicated stuff, but uh, where you consider every possible subset and remove things and you know, evaluate, but now you run into a combinatorial explosion because you have to consider every possible subset of things, subset of nodes, and that's not gonna be uh, feasible. So the best, you, I mean, the most reasonable thing or a reasonable thing to do would be to do this greedily. As far as this class is concerned, the most uh, re the thing that we will do is we will fix the depth of the tree, but in order to determine which depth is good, we will use a generalization of the strategy of validation called cross-validation. Cross-validation is a really important concept in empirical machine learning. You'll be talking about, you're gonna use that in your homework. Um, there's a very detailed description of this uh, in the homework. So I encourage you to think about this carefully. Every single learning algorithm we'll encounter will have hyperparameters. Hyperparameters are parameter are you know choices that govern how the learning algorithm will run. For example, in this case, it's the depth of the decision tree. The depth of the decision tree governs when the ID3 uh, recursion should stop. Every learning algorithm will have its own set of hyperparameters and the choice of these hyperparameters will govern whether how much the classifier that we produce overfits. 
So the goal is we need to find a good set of hyperparameters, use those to find a classifier. How do you find a good set of hyperparameters? You use some sort of a heuristic. The most so commonly used or perhaps the most robust heuristic, though a little computationally expensive one, is to use this idea called cross-validation that we will see a little bit more in uh, uh, on Tuesday, but I want you to read that uh, in the uh, you know uh, in the homework description because you'll be implementing this. You'll be implementing cross-validation for every single homework in this uh, um, class, so you should probably understand this uh, in a bit of detail. All right, so I'm almost out of time, so let me wrap up. We looked at decision trees. This was our first learning algorithm. Prediction's easy. It's a popular machine learning tool where uh, essentially you can think of this as 20 questions. We grow a tree, one for e uh, where every node consists of a feature. If you have Boolean features, decision trees can represent any Boolean function uh, with binary classification. We looked at a single greedy heuristic for uh, decision tree learning, namely the ID3 algorithm. There are many robust implementations. Uh, you may come across algorithms called C4.5 or C5, which are essentially the ID3 algorithm with information gain, but uh, with a lot of bells and whistles. You can use decision tree for regression. We didn't encounter that, but if you are interested in that, look up CART, C-A-R-T. Um, and the more, one of the most important points we have encountered today is this notion of overfitting. Decision trees are prone to overfitting unless you actually take effort to avoid it. So the limiting the depth is an important thing. One last question and uh, I'll stop. Um, are, what other hyperparameters are used? In some sense, it could be depth, it could be the number of paths um, and such things. So I'm going to not answer that question right away, but maybe you can kind of start a discussion on Canvas and I'll, I'll talk about that partly because we can bring this up on Tuesday because we are about a minute over time. So let's uh, wrap up. Thanks.